Thank you, uh, Neetu, and it's with great uh, pleasure that I have come to Mr. Ashish Johan and to Arvind Upal. Uh, one, of course, is a, a very distinguished stock market leader, uh, not just uh, uh, for India, but indeed uh, for the world in many specific areas which he will, I'm sure, touch upon as we go on. And Arvind, what should I say, he's one of the youngest uh, retired uh, uh, business leaders we have uh, in our country uh, with great experience in many uh, verticals, including uh, consumers, including uh, the growth story of India. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, two distinguished leaders and may I first begin with you, uh, Arvind. Uh, could you just uh, touch upon the India story as you see it? Okay, so I think right now India stands out as an outlier because I think across the world there's a softness post the high inflation. It's not that India is not suffering inflation, India is suffering it as well. But uh, I think because you said consumer, there's a softness on the consumer side, but overall Indian GDP growth is good and economy is good because there's a huge amount of spending happening on the infrastructure, on the investment side. So consumption is relatively soft to what you would expect, but investment is driving the growth, which is not bad for a country like India, because consumption must follow investment. And uh, we are kind of now going down the right path, and our ability to spend, or our, I think, uh, reason to spend will happen once we've invested. And therefore, I think we're now embarking on the right way to go. Thank you. Uh, Ashish, uh, India has been uh, pre-COVID and again now post-COVID the fastest growing large economy in the world. And uh, this has been led substantially, as Arvind uh, pointed out, by investments on the infrastructure, heavy investments in the infrastructure. Uh, now, a lot of the uh, corporates who uh, are in, in, in the infrastructure sector are listed companies on your stock exchange. So, in a way, uh, you are playing a major role. When I say you, I mean you and the National Stock Exchange are playing a major role in India's growth story. So, I would like you to touch the correlation between the growth story and the National Stock Exchange and the companies listed on it. So, in a way, stock markets are a, what I call a fulcrum or uh, platforms on which uh, the countries uh, create wealth, they create jobs. Uh, the theory is that households save the money in economy and the corporates need money. And so, you need to channelize the savings in a most efficient way. Many countries do it through the banking system, many countries do it. In a balanced way, some banking and some uh, what we call disintermediation. Banking part is called intermediation. Uh, the stock market is called disintermediation. So you can see Germany, which is more banking oriented. America is more um, banking plus markets. And so India, uh, till ninety one, was a, a purely banking country. But the stock markets were sort of uh, tolerated, but uh, not considered important to uh, India's economic growth. Only post liberalization, um, there was some space given to stock markets, and NSE was set up in uh, from '92 to '94 after a major scandal in other exchange, uh, and that's where uh, that time India's total market capitalization, I recall, uh, was around uh, a four hundred thousand crores, as we call it. That is. Um, and today it has gone up uh, 80 times in 29 years. November 394 is when we started NSE's equities market. Today uh, it is um, uh, 3.25 crore, crore uh, which is uh, basically 3.8 or 3.9 trillion US dollars. And if you look at the banking in terms of the total market capitalization, uh, after the US, China plus Hong Kong, because Hong Kong is now in China, and Japan, India is the fourth largest market capitalized in any country. Now imagine a country with $2,600 per capita income, which is one of the poorest in terms of the per capita income. 
And how do poor people invest in other poor people uh, economy in their companies? Poor people are not supposed to save, and if they save, they save usually in utensils and other things. But in India, by quirk of fate, and of course the way the regulations evolved, the society evolved, the parliament evolved, we have now 82.5 million unique investors directly investing in Indian stock markets. Almost 18-19% of all households in India directly invest in stock markets and that tells you the power of uh, what is happening and it is also telling you how a new economy, a young economy which is very high tech oriented, although India is the oldest civilization, oldest living, living civilization in the world, it's also a very young independent country, it is the largest in terms of number of people, uh, it is a democracy, it is very raucous, but still the markets have played a huge role in, a, in creating wealth that today one out of every three rupees Indian consider, Indians consider as wealth is now com coming out of uh, the stock markets and 82.5 million people, if you, I was a country, NSE was a country, uh, I would be the 20th largest country in the world and very rich, right? And so that's why, why I'm telling you this is uh, that stock markets uh, are the fulcrum but going from now into the future, stock markets will play even bigger role in um, creating jobs, creating wealth, uh, providing that small little capital that is required by youngsters. Uh, I'll come back to another question on this to be a follow-up, but before that, let me uh, uh, ask Arvind to you know explain in many uh, of the sort of training and learning workshops that I've been to, they talk about the, the frugal innovation that many companies in India have initiated, which is brought about uh, customer power or consumer power. Uh, for example, the sachets for shampoos, uh, for the tobacco, chewing tobacco, and many other products. That, to what extent have you say, uh, did, you know, uh, that, that wave came in a way before the, the, the sort of wave of Indians investing in the stock markets because traditionally Indians were people in jewellery, housing, that sort of investment, banks. Uh, so could you just try and link how the, the, the millions and millions of the bottom of the pyramid consumer has in a way graduated into the stock markets? I think India as a nation has got mastery on low cost innovation. Uh, in, in local parlance we call it jugaad. Uh, so there's a positive side to it and there's a negative side to it but if we can capture I would say uh, the philosophy of low cost innovation even as we develop into a more process oriented nation. Uh, it is something that we shouldn't leave behind because I mean the recent uh, spaceship launch I mean, it's uh, at such ridiculously low costs, and I've seen it in my own company and uh, various other outliers that the kind of stuff we could do in India, uh, you can't do anywhere else in the world. I think we probably got the most creative engineers in the world right now. Engineers by nature, you know, it's black and white, and they're not supposed to be very creative, but we are very creative engineers, and they are they really collaborate to get things done. Uh, because when you're an economy with uh, $2,400 or $2,500 per capita income uh, and you want to adapt the as to the aspiration, people are seeing things all over the world on their mobile phones and, and so you want to give them that stuff then you have to adapt it to Indian conditions and that requires a lot of creativity and that kind of baffles the world sometimes. Yeah. Uh, I, I just hope that we can take this low cost innovation and keep it as a going running philosophy even as we get more process oriented, become larger, wealthier. Yeah. So, so, it's, so it's a big positive because oh, it's a huge positive. I, I heard or oh, maybe I miss, misheard you saying it's got positives and negatives. Oh, well, so let's forget the negatives. Yeah. I think it's, it's got a, huge positives. Huge positives. And, uh, huge positives. and, and I think the, the wealth created in all this is a, in a way now transferring uh, to the stock exchanges and the national stock exchanges by far the biggest uh, 
uh, stock exchange we have uh, in India. And uh, if I remember correctly, uh, the largest number of uh, shareholders that any company has, the number one, number two and number three, all are India, India and India. Uh, if I remember correctly, you have the Yes Bank with over five million uh, uh, shareholders. It, the number two is the Tata Power with 3.8, followed by Reliance with 3.6. So I think you have a, we, we, when I say you, I'm equally Indian. Uh, I think we have a great thing uh, going. And the technology benefit that India has, you're bringing up very aggressively uh, in, into uh, the Indian uh, markets. Uh, I don't know if you'd like to touch on one or two of the uh, really cutting uh, technology leadership that you're bringing into the stock exchange in India. In a way, I think I'll take off uh, from where he said uh, that engineers in India are very creative. I'm also an engineer, so thank you. Uh, but <laughs> I, I incidentally, so am I, so thank you again. All for sure. <laughs> right? So for me, uh, I think uh, in some ways, uh, MSE's uh, origination as a floorless exchange. Before that, all exchanges were on floors, right? There are physical floors, people will get together, shout at each other, do some trading, by the way, and that's how. Uh, it used to be fun for the people who traded, not for the people who invested, because there used to be a lot of uh, uh, issues on what price you traded and stuff like that, and how settlements happened. Uh, and so, uh, when India implemented MSE in ninety two to ninety four, um, it was the first automated uh, order matching system in the world which became successful. Before that, London Stock Exchange had tried from nineteen eighties to nineteen eighty nine spent a billion pounds uh, and uh, in a project called Taurus and nothing came out. Uh, and so when MSC became successful uh, using satellite telecom, because those days it would take five years to get a telephone line at home. Mm. How do you create a nationwide uh, continuously available telecom system which also is matching com on computers and computers to fail across the world uh, periodically, literally frequently few times a day. And so you have to give a continually available telecom you have to continually uh, also have working um, sort of system with complement hardware, software, everything. It was a miracle that happened in 92 to 94 when we set up NSE using the first time in the world satellite telecom network for uh, stock trading and things like that. And so uh, from there, uh, that day onwards, India has been uh, the pioneer and leader in stock market technologies in the world. Then in quick succession, uh, we implemented real-time margining system and set up uh, uh, counter guarantee system, counter party guarantee system so that in case one broker defaults, other people uh, don't have to suffer. Before that, any time a broker defaulted, the entire market used to close down. Uh, so that was done. It's now known as CCP in the world. Uh, and then we set up a dematerialized uh, deposit. There used to be share certificates which are physical. Uh, now it's all automated like your uh, money in bank account which is bits and bytes that was set up in 96 97 and so, so, so are you saying that if i as an investor invest in the stock market through uh, any of the normal brokers uh, which are listed on the exchange i can never lose my money unless i invest in the wrong uh, instrument i mean there, there is no, no it's the a, broker it, cannot take me for a ride if you if you uh, are say, one is broker cannot take the system for a ride. Earlier, when the brokers used to default, entire all other brokers had to stop. Yeah. Now, an individual broker defaulting is not affecting other brokers, but still, an individual broker defaulting will affect uh, affect his clients. Okay. Uh, his own clients, yeah. but yeah. up to twenty five lakh rupees, which is uh, around two and a half million. Uh, two and a half million yeah, rupees, rupees, which is like thirty thousand US dollars. Up to that, the exchange provides you uh, set, uh, sort of investor protection. Oh, lovely. That if you are a small investor, you are supposed to be protected. But if you are a billionaire, you will know which broker to trade with. Don't yeah. come to me for protection. Yeah. And so we already. So you are protecting the. You were saying the number of uh, investors runs okay. into. Eighty-two point five million. Eighty-two point five million. So out of them. Uh, 80 million or more will be the small, small investors, right? So we basically the way I look at it is the automation 
uh, in stock markets was the first large successful public digital infrastructure project in India. Mm. And that um, not only created stock market, but also clearing houses or CCPs as we call it, then the depository systems, uh, and then all investor protection and everything else uh, in a structured way so that overall the market becomes more robust. Uh, information which companies have to provide uh, to the market has become more frequent earlier uh, in early 90s getting annual report used to be difficult today if you don't give quarterly results yeah. you have a problem right so uh, things have become much more streamlined so tell, tell, tell me you know Arvin uh, on this consumer and the growth story of India see pre-covid from what I heard our Indian growth and GDP was it was growing on as a consumption led economy Today, we are growing because it's an investment-led economy. Could you just explain that a little bit? I mean, how come suddenly the consumers have faded away and the infrastructure has overtaken that? I mean, would you like to educate me on that? So, global GDP has fallen. India's GDP yes. has largely remained flat to what it was pre-COVID in the range of 7, 7.5. But the nature of growth, uh, where that GDP is coming from, has changed. Because why has GDP fallen all over the world? It's fallen because of all the largest, all the governments did, all the liquidity infusion, and therefore the large amount of inflation that's floating around the world in commodities and, and uh, all kinds of uh, consumer products and so on. Poor nations, so when inflation strikes, it always affects poor people more than rich people. And technically, India is a poor nation by comparison. And therefore, high inflation should have infected, impacted India very badly. So this is one of the things which is probably not well understood, that India should have suffered very badly because of high inflation across the world. We've actually outperformed. And whether this was planned or unplanned, I don't know. But fact of the matter is, one of the thing that's driving the economic growth is the huge amount of infrastructure spending. Uh, that's going on by the government right now. If that had not happened, then the bottom of the pyramid is suffering from inflation right now. And you can see that in all consumer companies that mass market products are slowing down. Uh, rich people are spending, the upper middle, middle class and rich classes continue to spend. Uh, I would say that uh, it's a matter of time. India has got inflation under control. Uh, it's relatively modest. I've never heard of at least in my lifetime, I don't remember a time when India's inflation was lower than developed countries. So technically our currency should be strengthening, but that's a different discussion. Uh, at this point in time, I would say that uh, the government is trying very hard to incentivize employment and uh, resource creation amongst the uh, masses. Uh, that comes to agriculture and infrastructure development. It's a matter of a cycle. So I think if we can get through this current cycle and we see a softening of commodity costs coming down and then uh, you know, money flowing into the hands of the mass market, then I see a huge double whammy playing out. I see uh, both the consumption and the investment side playing out. Even if you look at consumption, sorry, I'm, I'm laboring the point. Even if you look at consumption, consumption is normal consumer products and then there's consumer discretionary. Right now, uh, a lot of the consumer discretionary companies are struggling a bit more because even within that uh, slowdown, uh, the money has you know, gone more towards experiences, travel, holidays, hotels. My theme parks. Yeah, theme parks. <laughs> and people are <laughs> not buying. We've got, a, and, and, huge, and, uh, and, we got a huge bump up. Exactly. Because of the and consumer can, pool you posts, can see the prices of hotels so that and has gone down now. It's tapering off. So obviously, that consumer discretionary has already shrunk, and then it's much of it has gone to experience. Let me pull you away from the stock exchange now. But he talked about this double bang, right? That our economy is growing rapidly, much better than the globe. In, in fact, about almost three times the global average. And that's because of infrastructure uh, push that the government has done. And I think we need to give a lot of credit to our Prime Minister, our Finance Minister, and all the Cabinet concerned, Mr. Gadkari also, you know, for this push that they have generated. 
Now, he was saying inflation has moderated, so the consumer will come back, the consumer pull, and the consumer oriented economy will go. So he used the word uh, double whammy. I actually would rather call it a, a double bang boom. Yeah. So do you see Indian uh, growth rates uh, going uh, beyond the six and a half, seven to eight, nine percent? Do you think that's possible in today's yeah. economy? See, I'll just take up from there, which in a way most people have missed out, is that in a poor country, uh, especially of India's time, the poorest people get hurt the most in when the inflation happens or when, even then in lockdown. He pointed that out. Right? He but pointed that out. what happened is during COVID, yeah. India also started putting in place a basic social security framework. Yes, that's true. Right? And one, I think, of course, on the, the medical uh, spend side, up to 500,000 rupees, now you can go to any hospital and get cured um, and government will pay. Uh, but more importantly, I think, in consumption itself, uh, eight, 800 million people okay. are getting uh, free food grains uh, every month. And now it's been extended for another five years, I think. What I'm saying, it's a social security framework. Yes, very good. In America, you get food coupons. Yes. Uh, in um, even Europe, you get something to compensate for the food. In India, because we have a ration uh, framework, uh, that is why we used to give ration to poor people at some cost, minor cost, but now it has become free. And that is the social security framework that has come into place without any uh, market here or any consumer guys knowing. What has happened is 800 million people, although for Indians it's not a big number, but it is actually more than US, Europe, Mexico, Canada combined. Right? <laughs> yes. So every year you are filling so many people. I recall, uh, I think in 2018 or something, uh, I think uh, UN. World Food Program under uh, uh, President Biden's son got a Nobel Peace Prize for giving free food to a uh, few people for a few months and of course the rest of the world's money. But they got the Nobel Peace Prize when Mr. Modi provides 800 million people every year for last five years and probably next five years. Nobody, even India worries that it's a Sir, perhaps judgment. they have to keep people in pipeline for Nobel Peace Prizes. So I hope he yeah. gets it soon. What I'm quite ready to tell you is this is what is going to actually increase and bump up your uh, consumer spend going forward because they don't have to spend or worry about their uh, so livelihood. This is wonderful news. I think we can end uh, this with a lost lot of optimism Absolutely. because uh, we are growing uh, at uh, six and a half, seven percent, uh, and we are doing that on, in a way, a single engine, Correct. which is the engine of investments in infrastructure and as soon as the consumer pull comes in again and we'll have perhaps uh, something like maybe out of 1.4 billion we'll have something like maybe a, a billion or 800 a million people buying in addition to right. this uh, infrastructure spend i think india is here to stay India is already the, I think, fifth largest economy in the world. Uh, people are saying that we are going to overtake. We are not sure really whether uh, Germany is already overtaken Japan or not, but there's a big debate on that. So I think the best thing is India should overtake both of them yeah. in another two years and become, you know, whatever, the third largest uh, economy on on nominal basis, forget purchasing power parity. So I think, uh, Nidu, uh, that's a very positive note to end on, and I think uh, thank you so much, Ashish, and uh, thank you so much, Arvind, uh, for your time and for your valuable insights into Indian uh, economy and Indian stock markets. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rajiv.